He is an entrepreneur, speaker, author, and fellow podcaster, founder of multiple startups, including Content Marketing Institute, otherwise known as CMI, which is the leading content marketing educational resource for enterprise brands. His latest venture is The Tilt. It's an, a, an email newsletter delivered twice weekly uh, dedicated to helping lonely content creators turn their business into a content empire. Joe's a pioneer in content marketing, first using the term back in 2001 before launching CMI and Content Marketing World. Uh, Joe's book, Epic Content Marketing, named one of the five must-read uh, business books of the year by Fortune Magazine and his one of his other books, Killing Marketing, is a personal favorite. He's spoken at more than 400 locations in 16 countries for events and organizations including South by Southwest, NAM, Fortune Magazine's Leadership Summit, uh, Nestle, General Motors, Oracle, DuPont, SAP, HP, Dell, hundreds more. Joe, thanks so much for joining us here on the Leadership Standard. Garrett, thank you. Such a wonderful uh, welcome. I appreciate it. But we got to start with the Cleveland Browns. It's not by <laughs> accident that the founder of Content Marketing Institute, along with Robert Rose, is wearing orange based in the city of Cleveland. Let's try. Right. Let's start there. Uh, yes, as you know, I'm a lifelong Browns fan. Uh, so we're not going to talk about what happened at the game yesterday because I know where your allegiances lie. But uh, yes, I, I've been I'm. I'm basically, I, I don't have any other outfits that are not orange. Uh, when we launched Content Marketing Institute back in 2007, I went off the deep end in the color orange. I, it's pers my personal brand. So everything we've done, even our, our nonprofit foundation, Orange Effect Foundation, has a little bit of orange in it. So you've come to the right place if you like orange. Well, maybe some uh, at some point we'll talk about your all-time favorite five Cleveland Browns, but I digress because okay. in the world of content marketing, let me take you into what is another personal favorite. One of my all-time favorite movies uh, is something that you've been labeled with, rightly or wrongly, you've been described as the godfather of content marketing, the one who's been pulling all the strings all along, who was a pioneer way back when. Joe, what's the story <laughs> behind how that happened? And how how did you, out of Cleveland, become known as the oh, godfather? I, you know, I, first of all, well, I can't believe you've gone, you went there, but you did. So I'll give you the detail. You know, I've been, I started in the content marketing industry in 2000. So it's been over 20 years now. And that's web 1.0, you know, and then we got into web two and all these social media networks. And, and I was lucky enough to be part of a custom publishing department. We sold custom activities to large business to business brands like Microsoft and Autodesk. And I said, oh my God, more and more content is going to be needed. These companies from around the world are going to have to learn to tell their own stories. They can't just interrupt people anymore. And that's when I, you know, I started using the term content marketing, as you said, in around 2001. And, and then went, you know, I had this entrepreneurial itch, started what became Content Marketing Institute in 2007. And just my first blog post was why content marketing? This was April 24th of 2007. And I said, you know, content marketing is going to be the thing. You know, we're targeting marketers. Marketers, they didn't like custom publishing. They didn't like the term custom media for what was going on in the industry. They liked marketing, like search marketing, direct marketing, social media marketing. So we have to use the term marketing. And then once we started calling it content marketing, we started to have a bunch more content uh, or uh, CMOs mm -hmm. and C-suite professionals that started to resonate with that term and said, oh, yeah. There is Google, there is Facebook, there's Twitter, there's now a thousand other ways our, we can communicate with our customers. What's the process? What's the strategy around that? And that became known as content marketing. And so now for 20 years, I guess I'm, I'm an OG. I don't know about the Godfather thing, but it has stuck, as you'd say. And I, when I go to events now and people introduce me, I do get introduced as the Godfather of, of content marketing. Maybe Polizzi, the last name, has something to do with it as well. I don't know if it's your Italian heritage or not, Joe. What I think it is, though, it's, I think it's the ultimate acknowledgement of respect. And Don Corleone. Or fear, a, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> but Don Corleone was a big fan of respect. But I, oh. 
I'm going back to April 24th, 2007. And when I researched a little bit about your origins and your story, that date, in my view, is a powerful date. And I bet you can remember April 24th, 2007, like yesterday, Joe. But I think to frame your answer, what was the world like in 2007? I mean, it's not like it is today at all. And I think it's helpful to see the future. You got to go back and when I think of 2007, I see a world radically different. But can you put us in that place in time and history? And more importantly, let our audience know what you were thinking and what you were seeing, envisioning as you foretold the future. It was so, it's, it's so weird, especially with what's going on now. And we could talk about a lot of the stuff that's going on in Web3. But we were really making that transition from Web1, which was basically, it was one-to-many communication. We had a website. People would go to that website, get information. You had you know classifieds. It's, oh, I'll just go and get information. And that's how we use the internet. And then we were going into, you had Facebook and you had Twitter and you had these other social, LinkedIn and these other social media platforms where you had many to many communication and you had these big players that were getting in the middle creating the ability for us to access audiences all over the world and they were enabling that to happen so we were at this point where you had blogs and you started to have podcasts and you started to have websites that had a little bit of content but basically 99 percent of the information that companies were putting out were about their products and services and i said oh my god we're gonna have to flip that we're going to have to focus on what's the kind of content that keeps our audiences up at night. What are their pain points? Because they don't care about our products and services anymore. They can go anywhere. They can get access any type of information they want and they can ignore us. So how do we create information that is not ignorable, that we can create remarkable information and we can build audiences that become to know, like, and trust us. And when they know, like, and trust us, they'll buy more of our stuff. We were right on the brink of that happening. So 2007 was when we we're like, okay, this content marketing is going to be like, I was, it was almost like a mission statement when I put that blog post, why content marketing out, Gary, I'm like, this is going to be the thing. I know you don't believe me now. And it literally took probably three years later until it went mainstream. And then I started to then get calls from chief marketing officers that would say, oh my God, Joe, I feel so behind. We're not doing, we're still almost all product and service content focused, but we can't get connections on Facebook. They don't want to listen, listen to our podcast. They don't want, we're doing all the things, but it's not working. I'm like, okay, we're going to have to get down to, as you know, from killing marketing media 101. What do media companies do to be so amazing? They focus on their audiences first, not on their product and service, but on their audiences. And that's really, you know, that took us into almost getting into web 2.5 or three, but that's where all these channels opened up and companies had to make a decision. Well, are we just going to talk about us? Or are we going to open up these amazing experiences for our customers? What does that mean? Does that mean we are in the media business too? It absolutely means that. And so you, you saw the changing of marketing become more like publishing. Now, hold that thought because, Joe, as you know, we're also being broadcast live throughout Tech Canada's uh, social media channels, uh, sure. LinkedIn Live, Facebook Live. I mean, we're actually walking our own talk in terms of what content marketing is. But uh, you know now uh, that our team at uh, Team Can uh, Tech Canada, Team Canada, uh, at the Tech Canada office in Calgary, they're keeping uh, an eye on the chat box. They're going to be sure, coming sure. in with uh, different questions at different times. That being said, uh, I know that now's the time. If you have a question for Joe, uh, this is the time to start thinking about how content marketing today in 2021 relates to what you're doing. So I want to give you again the platform, Joe. I, I want to hand you the ball like a sure. latter-day Greg Pruitt going around right end and say, how do you definitively define content marketing for anyone watching? So content marketing instead of interrupting our customers with information about our products and services, it is a strategy to figure out an audience first type of communication. So first of all, we think who is our audience and we're gonna deliver valuable, relevant, compelling information to that target audience over a long period of time to see some kind of behavior change happen. So it's still, this is still marketing. We're not just creating content for the fun of it. 
We want to, we want to develop content because we have some kind of a business goal. So any leader thinking about, oh, yeah, I don't want to just create blogs or podcasts or whatever. No, no, no. We're doing this as a strategic part. And we're going to, because we know over the years, why, why should we do this? Because if we deliver amazing information to an audience over a long period of time, their behaviors absolutely do change. Do you want them to stay longer customers? Maybe you'll deliver a magazine to them. Do you want to create their better customers, maybe higher yield. So you deliver a podcast to them on a long period of time and you measure it and you say, oh, those that listen to our podcast buy more stuff from us. Or maybe you create new uh, products and services from audiences that you never thought possible before. So we're really seeing, you know, if you, if you look at something like a Red Bull Media House, we're starting to see that happen in more and more uh, companies. Initially, when Red Bull came out, so Red Bull, you know, the energy drink company, they created this media company inside of Red Bull called Red Bull Media House. And you're like, okay, well, what is Red Bull now? The Red Bull is pretty much a media company that just happens to sell energy drinks. If you said, if you sold Red Bull or you sold Red Bull Media House, what would be valued more? I don't know. Gare is the answer to that. They're both amazingly valuable. They're just valuable in different ways. So what happens now is, if you think about the marketing department, yes, you want to drive products and service sales. I get that. But you, once you build a loyal audience, you can monetize that audience, as you know from Killing Marketing, 10 different ways. You can monetize it through direct uh, compensation, just like uh, a magazine would, uh, where you're selling sponsorship and advertising. If you look at one of the largest events in the world, uh, Dreamforce. Dreamforce is by Salesforce, a billion dollar event. So why is this a software company creating one of the largest media events in the world? Well, that's because we flipped the script. Everyone can be a media company today. So it doesn't just have to be, oh, I'm going to drive product and service sales. No, you can drive revenues all different ways. And by the way, if you want really good examples of that, Amazon, Apple, Google, they're all media companies and product and service companies. That's why, love it or hate it, Amazon, they drive more different kinds of revenue than ever, any company on the planet, which is why their stock price is $3,500 a share right now. It's amazing what we've seen happen. And a lot of people don't realize that Amazon at their heart is a media company to a bunch of different audiences. And we just have to think a little, little bit differently today about how we market. And instead of putting our product at the center, which generally we've done for decades, we put our audience at the center. And if you put your audience at the center, the possibilities for revenue are pretty much endless. I love what you just said. I mean, it it is part of the philosophy that I fell in love with when I read this book. By the way, if you're watching or listening to this podcast, you want to get out and grab Killing Marketing. Because I'll, I'll tell you, you and Robert Rose came up with such a bold statement, but it has to be bold Joe, in order to shake the tree leaves and, and flip the script as you spoke of, how innovative businesses are turning marketing cost into profits. So what if I understand correctly, and maybe you can do a deeper dive sure, sure. on this, whether it's Red Bull or Amazon or some of the other brands you've talked about, Apple, et cetera, everyone now has the ability to be a media company first to attract an audience and a fill in the blank company second. That, absolutely right. You know, it's funny. When, as, this is what I thought of when you said that. If I was launching a company today, this won't make any sense. But this is the way, this is why the flip, the, the script is, is flipped, as you say. Um, we, we probably should launch with no products. We probably should launch by focusing on an audience first. And if we focus on an audience first and then deliver whatever it is, let's say it's an email newsletter or a podcast or a Twitch stream or a YouTube series. If we focus on building the most loyal audience of fans around that, you know what happens is they will tell you exactly what they want to buy. That, that's what's now it's more difficult for probably a lot of the people listening to this today because you all have products and services you have, you know, you're responsible for many different P&Ls, if you will. So we have to do it a little bit differently, but it is difficult because all you're thinking about is product and service sales when you're competing out there with people that all they're trying to do is build an audience and a community, and then they can monetize that, that audience in way different ways than you. So yes, absolutely. And if you wanna call it a media company, yeah, I mean, media companies are selling products and services, marketing companies are selling media products. So what's a media company today? I don't, I don't know, Gare. 
I, mm. We're all selling the same. We can all monetize an audience the same way. We're all creating the, the thing that we create the most in organizations today, more than anything else is content. And the thing that we have the least amount of strategy about in an organization is content. We're just creating all sorts of content all over the place. And I want to see the people listening to this say, no, 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 there's a strategy behind this. We have a KPI, we have a business purpose, and we have a very specific audience we're trying to reach. And we want them to do a very specific thing. That's marketing. This is so fascinating, Joe, especially I know when you were dreaming about Content Marketing Institute and way before Content Marketing World, what does it feel like now in 2021 to see some of those early visions actually come to fruition, but also take us into the emerging consumer trends now? In terms of, especially since the pandemic, what do business leaders need to know now? So what's interesting is, is that we've been through Web 2.0 and Web 2.0 is about five or six, a handful of tech companies that have basically built all the audiences themselves and we are renting those audiences. So if you look at uh, what Twitter has done and what Facebook has done and what LinkedIn has done, we're the we're we're individuals we have been the products to them we have thought we've been building these and that's fine i have no problem with social media but let's just talk about their business models they have leveraged us and us creating all this content and they built their amazing audiences and we've sort of live within that environment well now we're moving into web 2.5 or web web 3 and now we're we're becoming decentralized again with I don't want to go down too far into the rabbit hole of cryptocurrency and NFTs and those types of things. But what's happening is, is that um, there is more opportunity today. And we've seen this what happened with the pandemic. Now entrepreneurs and businesses can go out and build an audience. They can build a business model. They can monetize that audience in many ways. And if you're listening to this today and you're marketing, you have to realize that you're not just competing with your competitive set. When it comes to marketing, you're competing with me if I'm in that area, or you're competing with Google, and you're competing with Amazon, and you're competing with Apple. So that means we've got to do two things differently. We actually have to find what we call a content tilt. You have to find an area of differentiation, a hook, something that people will have a reason to pay attention to your content. So what is it? That's why if we lead product first, we lose them. The second thing is consistency. And I'll give you a real good example of this, Gare. Anyone listening to this, go to your own YouTube page. We all have our own YouTube pages, right? Go to your YouTube page and see how consistent the delivery is of the content on your YouTube page. You'll find probably that there, you know, you have one upload here, then you have two the next week, then you have nothing. Then you have something about some presentation that somebody in your company did and it's all over the place. We can't afford to do that anymore. We have to treat every one of these channels like we are professional media providers because the only way to build an audience is one, have that content tilt, be truly differentiated, and two, deliver consistently over a long period of time. That's how you build an audience. That's how you build an audience since forever. But we haven't done that. We've been thinking that, oh my God, all these channels are available and we have to do all the things. And what a big company does is they start creating content to all these different channels. They do so haphazardly. They create mediocre content. It does nothing for the audience. It does nothing for the organization. And that's why a lot of people listening to this will probably say, content marketing doesn't work for me. And I'm like, it's because you're not doing content marketing. You're just creating content. It's content run, run amok. There's no purpose behind that. There's no mission behind that content. So what I'd like to recommend, just to take a little burden off everyone's backs, is start killing some things. As we say, killing marketing. You don't have to be everywhere your customers are at online in unremarkable ways. Only do what you can do amazingly well and say, okay, well, maybe we shouldn't do the podcast. Maybe we should focus on a great YouTube experience or a great Facebook experience or an amazing email newsletter. And we have to get the resources from somewhere. So that's what you're seeing right now in 2021. And that's the opportunity is more companies that I talk to, Gare, larger companies mostly, we're saying, look, don't create more content, create less content, Focus on channels that you can be remarkable at, but at to very specific audiences, and that's how you will win. So you don't have to be all things to all people. What I love about your message, and I'll just come out and say it, is that it's universal. So you run in a world, you populate a world, Joe, where there's a lot of companies doing a billion or more. Yeah. I, I would say the big, big businesses. Yes. 
depending on, and we could get into the semantics of it all, but depending on how you uh, calculate it, I would say anywhere from 10 million to a billion in revenue, you're talking small to medium business. Sure. All right. And you can hear my dogs in the background are agreeing with Agreed. me, right? Yes. Theodore and Sophie <laughs> and Maggie have heard this <laughs> argument many times, but let's, you and I focus for a moment on B2B because sure. there are some business leaders out there. They're in manufacturing, they're in distribution, they're in a pure B2B, and they will think in a default way that, well, this doesn't apply to me, what you're talking about. Bring oh, us I, down. Br let's explore that, Joe, and open up the universality of this message. Well, I love that question because I grew up in business to business. That's that's what I've loved. And that's where my passion is at. And that's honestly, Gary, where the biggest opportunity is, because wherever you can define a niche audience, that's the biggest opportunity. So I'll give you a couple examples. So there's Indian manufacturing in upstate New York. India manufactures industrial soldering equipment. Can't get more B2B than industrial soldering equipment. They have 27 engineers that blog on a regular basis that has become over the past 10 years, the number one lead generation service that they provided Indium for new products and services. So they've actually, they've hired an editor, professional content editor to work with these engineers who are not great writers, but they work with them. They figure out how they're going to communicate online. They consistently deliver over a long period of time. And what's happened is if you search for anything on industrial soldering equipment, you'll find Indian products and services, but they lead with their engineers, their expertise and content first. So that's just a very simple example. And what they've done really well is they just focused on a great blog. They didn't say we have to do the podcast and the Twitch stream and be on TikTok and God knows what else, right? They said, we're going to be on one or two things and we're going to do that really well. Then on the other, so let's look at, that's a smaller business example. Let's look at a larger business example, like an Aero Electronics. They're in the electronics distribution space. They said, well, we don't know if we want to create all these different blogs and websites and whatever. So so how do we do this? And, and we don't want to wait so long because it does take a couple of years in some cases to build an audience. They said, we're going to go out and buy it. They identified 50 different media sites out there and they went and bought them. So now today, if you said, Joe, who's the largest media company in the elect B2B electronics space? I would say, well, it's not a media company, theoretically. Mm -hmm. It's Aero Electronics. They, they deliver products and services in the electronics space. They have over 3 million people in their audience right now. And by the way, each one of their 50 brands in and of themselves are profitable. Now think about this. That means they've got 50 little departments that are creating media sites, events, magazines, whatever. Each one of them, it's not a marketing expense. They're, they're throwing off profit. And then at the same time, they're driving more products and services. So this is like a win-win. Anybody listening to this think that your, your marketing expenses actually break even or make money? Arrow does. So they've been able to do that. That's what, that's the position we can be in today. So whether you're a smaller company like an Indium or whether you're a larger company like Arrow and you can purchase your way there, there's an opportunity in B2B. And I, and I mean, there's nothing wrong with the consumer side, but your numbers have to be a little bit higher. But you can have a loyal fan, fan base of 200, 300, 500. When I first started in the business in 2003, we did a project for Agilent Technologies to 150 executives. I mean, we can be so focused because when you're talking to, to people, decision makers that can make multi-million dollar decisions, you don't need a lot of them, right? But it's still an audience you want to build. You and I talk to business leaders every week. We've been doing it for years. Uh, we're only meeting for the first time today, but I'm curious to know your thoughts on a phrase. Another, you came up with content marketing, a Herbert Simon I think as far back as 1972 coined the phrase attention economy to yep. the point where today, Joe, attention equals currency. However, there is still, and I think this is what you're talking about, where the opportunity lies, because there are still way too many, in my view, 50 and overs who are uh, complaining about this a uh, wonderful opportunity to leverage these platforms, uh, but also uh, stuck in, 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 the, in the idea that being invisible is somehow a strategy. But your thoughts uh, on the attention economy and the need, because I, I, the way I'm looking at it, if a business doesn't get attention, it's going to die. 
I would just suggest to everyone listening to this is just look how you engage in information. I, I, you watch Netflix movies? Do you watch videos on YouTube? Do you listen to podcasts? Like I'm a huge podcast listener. I usually listen to four or five hours a day while, while I'm working out, while I'm running, whatever the case is, while I'm mowing the lawn, I listen, I engage, I'm learning as much as I can. I'm reading books as often as I can. So if you think about how you learn as a decision maker, that's, this, your, your customers, your consumers are doing the same thing. So what you want to think about is, okay, well, generally you ha probably have a larger advertising budget. I have no problem with advertising, but you have to get your ROI out of advertising immediately. And it costs a lot of money. What I want to do is I want to have something work for me, build an asset over a long period of time that I don't have to keep spending for over and over again. I'll give you a really good example. You mentioned my post on April 24th, I did a post right after that called What is Content Marketing? That post I wrote in 2007. That post today gets between 500 and 1,000 people a day to that post. That one post that's 1, 1,200 words that I wrote and then continue to update it over 14 years ago. Do you know the amount of ROI? I can't, it's a billion times ROI for that post because of the amount of subscriptions that we've had come in through that post and the amount of people that go to content marketing world and spend a lot of money with training or whatever the case is. So if you think about that, you're like, wow, that's amazing. I didn't have to advertise to do that. So and I'm not saying we should move all our money from advertising, mm. but I'm saying is let's look at instead of building expense lines, let's build assets in our organization. So an asset is something that you can monetize over a long period of time that continues to grow in asset value as you go. That's what we're talking about when you build a blog, when you build an email newsletter, when you build a podcast, those things can be monetized and it's not just one off and you're done. So I still get, so as you said, Robert Rose and I have done a podcast called This Old Marketing. We're coming up on our 300th episode of that. Our number one uh a program that we did that was about John Deere's The Furrow Magazine, basically back in November of 2013, we still get 50 to 100 people a month going to that podcast from way back then. So that's why I want to start to have people listening to this think a little bit differently about what marketing is. It's not, oh, it has to be right now at this point in this process, whatever. It, but if we focus on, oh, here's our audience, here's what their needs are, here's how we're going to deliver to this um, this thing on a regular basis, and they're not necessarily going to buy tomorrow, but I know if we do this right, they they got we got a good shot at them becoming buyers of our service in six months, nine months, twelve months. That's why it's long term. So I will end with this, Gare. If you're if you're short term thinking, listening to this, and you say, hey, I'll do some content marketing, I'll try it out, and I've got three to six months. What can you do? Don't even do it. Go out and interrupt people. Go buy advertising. You're not, it's not going to work with a content marketing program. But if you said, Hey, I got 12 to 18 months. Do you think we could build a loyal audience in that time and see some significant change in our organization? I could say, yeah, that is a really good opportunity to do that. I couldn't agree more metaphorically. I describe it, Joe, as it's the classic tortoise and the hare. Yep. Isn't it? It really is. And the turtle is going to win this content marketing race. Before we explore the tilt, which I think is fascinating, just before we do that. Here on the leadership standard, we have a few standard questions we ask, sure. not the least of which is around the subject that we're so fascinated by here ourselves, leadership. How, in your opinion, Joe, straight from your offices in Cleveland, Ohio, how would you define leadership? Uh, leadership is all about action to me. I mean, leadership is what people see, it's not what you say. Um, so, I mean, I'm a big one for speeches. Like I, we, we just had a team meeting today. I gave my speech. We've got some new products and services coming out and I'm, I'm raw rawing with the best, but what makes the most difference is I'm doing the work with them. In a lot of cases, I'm going on site with them. I want to be near, I want to support them. I want to focus first on the needs of them, my employees as individuals. And if we do that really well, they will be amazing team members. So those are the types of things that I'm thinking about. And I've, you know, we've been around for a while. I've had a lot of bosses over, over my time. And you know the ones that are out there uh, saying the right things and not doing the right thing. So I'm very particular about doing an action. And that's why 
I have a list of goals and I review those goals every day. I look at goals in my career, uh, my career goals, my spiritual goals, my mental goals, my physical goals, and my family goals. And I want to make sure every day I read those so that I follow that guidance in action every day. And it's because it's really hard um, as a human being to stay on track. So we've got to train ourselves, teach ourselves to stay on point and, and to do the right things during the day. I love, I love knowing that uh, about the discipline and, and the daily actions you take. Also in that spirit of leadership, Joe, they say there's no better teacher than failure. Is there something <laughs> that you failed at that you continue to harvest yeah. to this day? Can, and can you share that? Yeah, it's funny. My favorite quote of all time is if you have tried something and failed, you are vastly better off than if you had tried nothing and succeeded. So I bask in failure. Content Marketing Institute exists because I failed in the business previous to it. The difference is I just, I just didn't give up. I just had it. I had a really supportive family that kept pushing me and said, you know, this is not it. You, you don't have to give up. Keep iterating, keep pivoting and, and go into it. And that, that was... That was the biggest failure because when I, you know, we've talked a little bit about the history of Content Marketing Institute, but when I launched CMI, you know, I had no money, I had two kids, two and four years old. And by 2009, we were bleeding cash. I mean, we, I was done and I literally was looking for a job. And, and luckily, the learning that I had from that, first of all, failure, bad business model, bad decision all the way. But what I learned from is, okay, where can, where can I go right here? And I started listening to my audience. So luckily during this whole time of 2007 to 2009, we were building a blog, an audience through our blog. And I wasn't paying attention to what they were telling me. And I got a really low one. This is September, 2009, I lowest of lows. I'm about ready to leave the whole business. And I started to look at the blog comments and I started to read the emails from the audience. And they said, Joe, we love what you're doing, but are there any training programs out there? And Joe, is there, are there any in-person events around this thing? I'd like to take my, my team to an in-person event and learn about the practice of content marketing. And I'm like, oh my God, they're, once you build an audience, they were, they're telling me exactly the products and services to launch. And we launched with a software as a service product that didn't work out. And I'm like, oh my God. So that was my big learning. And I'll never make that mistake again is build the audience, but then just listen, set up listening posts. My, my, one of my mentors, Jim McDermott, when I got into publishing in 2001, he said, the most important thing you can do as a media professional is listen. So you have to set up as many opportunities to listen as possible. So we can do that online. We can listen on Twitter. We can do surveys. We can call up our customers. We can call up our audience. We can send notes to our audience. So I do that deliberately every day now, because I know that the next great idea for the business will come directly from our audience. I, I can't help but think of, and I, this is a, a content marketing victory for a company named Dollar Shave Club, that March 6, 2012, when they posted that video about their razor blades, how they're effing great, everything changed from there. When did things change? Can you pinpoint the tipping point for Content Marketing Institute where it went from the lowest of lows and you knew it was going to explode? Um when, well, the my my moment was when I walked out on stage of the first content marketing world because I thought the business was going to fail until I walked out and we held an event in Cleveland, Ohio, and I was hoping for 100 people to show up for this international event in, of all places, Cleveland, Ohio, and we ended up getting 660 that year, and three years later, we had 4,000. So that that's the kind of thing that you, you don't expect. Um, again, not one thing. It was, it, it was a, as you said, it was the tortoise. It was a slow, basically what happened is we started with the consistent process. We repositioned content marketing as an industry. We put a content marketing strategy behind it. And we partnered with a lot of people to help figure out, will you use this term? Do you like this term? Will you talk about this term? And I probably did, in addition to something like this, Gare, I mean, I probably was on one year, 200, 300, webinars, blog posts, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm evangelizing what's going on. And then all of a sudden, I think maybe it was, it might've been South by Southwest. I went to South by Southwest in 2010 
And they actually had a session there that was called content marketing. And it almost blew me away that we had people, leaders in the industry that were using the terminology that only we were using up to that point. And then now today, everybody's using that term. But it, it shows you that if you have a process behind it, and that's basically, you know, we didn't talk about it, but one, of, one great strategy that people could follow is call something different, something that resonates a little bit different. Instead of calling it some boring term that your industry has been using forever, call something that you think might resonate a little bit more, that's a little bit more personal, that has a little bit more impact, put a strategy behind it and you can make change happen. But so that one was a, was a point Gare, but I think overall it's just slowly happened. And then by 2011, that was the industry term. And then we did hockey stick growth, which by the way, you'll see in every content marketing program, because it's that slow burn. And then once you get to a point, we call a minimum viable audience, an audience that you can actually monetize. It then goes straight up from there. So we went very quickly from losing a ton of money to a million dollars in revenue to $10 million in revenue. And it just, you know, success came from there. Uh, I, I now want to get into this latest um, exploration, if you will, this latest initiative called The Tilt. And uh, to be honest, when I first saw this and started to study it, Joe, I thought, well, historically, and I'm going to ask you the question, historically, is this a way to describe differentiation without using the word? Yep. <laughs> like the if if the issue is differentiation, then we need to use a phrase that describes it without using it. Is that fair? That's that's probably true. So the the the, the tilt name comes from the, actually the so my my latest book, Content Inc. There's seven steps. The second step and the most important is the content tilt. And the tilt is all about finding your area of differentiation that you can break through all the content clutter out there and actually build an audience. So we've talked about how much content clutter is out there and people will say, oh, there's so much content out there. How does it break through? And I said, I would always say, well, there's been more, too much content to engage in since the dawn of the printing press. This is not new. We've only had so many hours in a day. So we just have to have really remarkable life-changing content. And that's whatever that tilt will be. So that might be focusing on a more specific audience. We talked about what Indium has done with engineers. Maybe we focus on a very small portion of engineers. Maybe we do what we did with content marketing and we name it something different. Maybe we go on a platform like a Twitch and say, no B2B company is using Twitch as a platform. Maybe there's an opportunity to stream all day long. Maybe there's there's no heating and air conditioning uh, uh, service professionals that have a podcast. They all have videos. Maybe we should do a podcast. So doing something different to break through all that clutter. And we, I've said this before, I probably said it on this show here. There's two reasons why content marketing programs fail. The first is there's no differentiation. There's no hook. There's no why. There's no reason that we deserve attention. The second thing is consistency. If you said, Joe, why do most content marketing programs fail? The, or, or get cut or get killed, it's usually not for um, the, the, the return. They're usually doing pretty well. It's usually because they stop. Somebody stops sending the blog. Somebody stops sending the podcast. It's not sent consistency. And it's consistently. And just think about for those people like you and I that used to get the newspaper. What happened when you used to go out in the morning and you'd open up the front door and you'd look for that newspaper and it's not there. What happens? You're devastated. And then you're saying, now I got to go somewhere else to find my information. And what, what do we do? We all, we all stopped our subscriptions. <laughs> so now we don't have that anymore. That's the content is a promise to your customers. So you have to keep that promise. So that's that consistency. But the most important to your point, the reason why we created the Tilt is find that differentiation. And we try to teach that to content creators so they can build businesses. Let's go deeper into the Tilt, Joe. In fact, let's do this. Let's use a real life example, just happen to be, you know, surfing the web, happen to be on your website. And I saw this story about a minor <laughs> league baseball team. And I want you to take the, the baseball and run with it on this one, because in Savannah, Georgia, the Savannah Bananas, as you know, Joe, are redefining what the baseball fan experience is like. That's right. And so I think they're a great example of what the tilt is so that people can see it in a visual fashion. By the way, yes, I can't, uh, you can't like this example enough. I learned about this a couple months ago. Uh, it, 
basically they asked the question, why is baseball baseball? Like, why does everything have to be the way that it's always been? So there was, you know, there was no uh, minor league team in Savannah. They said, okay, we're going to do something in Savannah, but how do, this is not a baseball town. How, how do we make this thing go? And they questioned everything along the way. They said, no, no, no. You got to remember, this isn't baseball. This is an experience. This is a fan experience. It just happens. To, there's just baseball going around. This is content. So just baseball happens to go on. So they did things like, okay, well, instead of the first pitch, we're going to throw out a first banana. That's kind of fun. Okay, great. Instead of uh, wearing traditional uniforms, what if the Savannah Bananas, our team, had quilts or kilts on? And what if what if instead of there being a PA announcer that would announce them, what if they actually announced themselves? And what if there wasn't a... Uh, um, at the beginning, before the, the national anthem, what if we actually had the, the baby banana of the game and they actually have a baby and they hold up like you do in Lion King and they hold it up and everybody loves this. And by the way, all the tickets are all inclusive. So you get there, it's all for one price. And by the way, they sell out every single game, become the most popular minor league franchise around because they looked at it and said, this is a different, we don't have to do what everybody else does. They've done it differently. And they've created this, these rabid fans that just love what they're doing. So I love what Jesse and the team have done over there at Savannah Bananas because they just question everything. So that's, that would be my question for everyone else. It's like, okay, we're going to do a podcast on supply chain issues. Well, why do you have to do the Q and A like everyone else is doing? And why do you have to talk about these issues like everyone else is doing? And why does it have to be 45 minutes like everyone else is doing? Pick your hook, pick your tilt, do something different, be interesting, and then deliver that over a long period of time and you will build an audience. Well, in that spirit, we're going to go to uh, Stephen Christofferson, uh, no relation to Chris, who's uh, back at the Tech Canada offices in Calgary with a question uh, from somebody who's been watching live. And yes, Jesse Cole and the Savannah Bananas, uh, the guy wears a yellow tuxedo and top hat uh, seven days a mm -hmm. week and has totally turned uh, the baseball experience upside down. In fact, Joe, you'd probably agree Um it's a great, one of the best small business examples of, uh, they're a media company that happens to run a minor league baseball. You know, right on the, before we get to Steven, this is really important because this, because I, you know, that I put that in my newsletter. I sent that newsletter out as a tweet within 15 minutes. I got a response from the CEO of Savannah Bananas, Jesse, that sent me a personalized video and thanked me for doing that. That's I mean, can you imagine a better experience? I am a I am a fan of Savannah forever because of what Jesse did. Not only because of what they do, but his response to that and him setting up his own listening posts and building that relationship with me. It's unbelievable. Yeah, and, and just so you know, uh, we're waiting for Stephen to come on uh, with a question from our office in Calgary. But yes, uh, Jesse was telling me, um, we had him on, I'm going to guess Joe maybe two months after the pandemic. Okay. <laughs> okay. And, and so I've been following this story for a while, but the point is uh, he doesn't see the media world the same way as everybody else does in his industry. And I think they're a great, uh, to your point, they're a great visual example and a yep. real life example of someone small working the tilt to their advantage. Stephen is ready for the question out in Calgary, Alberta. Amazing, thank you. Uh, so quite a few questions here in the chat about the future of content marketing, but one's really interesting. Facebook's recent name change to Meta is arguably the introduction of the next digital frontier. How do you see content marketing evolving by 2020, by 2030? By 2030, oh my God. Yeah. I'm gonna be completely bald and really, <laughs> really have the gray beard by that time. All right. So here's my take. I've been following this gear uh, pretty closely. First of all, a lot of people have personal opinions about Facebook. Let's put those to the side. Let's put it to the side that he used Neil Stevenson's uh, Snow Crash, great book, uh, his take on the metaverse, and he's taking metaverse and calling it meta. I got to admire uh, what Zuckerberg's doing on this one, because what he's saying is that he's saying that digital property will be as important or more important as physical property in the very near future. And I absolutely 100% believe that. 
We don't see that ne necessarily happening today, but you already are seeing the fact that most dollars, most money is digital money. We think that they're all things that you can hold and feel, but it isn't. Everything's digital. The same same thing is coming coming out of digital real estate. So it's funny. I have one of my uh, family members is a real estate investor, didn't understand what I did. And the way that I explained it was, we are creating our own digital real estate, get our own audience online to build that. And then we that's an asset for us. We're going to see this happen in digital communities online, then we don't know how this is going to be. It's starting with things like NFTs, where people are buying digital property that, that are basically artwork, but now it's moving into things where creators and musicians will sell exclusive tickets to exclusive experiences. So a lot of people listening to this right now, you could create your own NFT around your own membership program, or maybe you have your own event and you're saying, well, uh, maybe there's a hundred people that want an exclusive experience, a fan experience. You could sell them a something digitally where they could put it in their digital wallet and they have proof that they own that. That's a non-fungible token. That's a, basically a unique token. Fungible token, by the way, is like a dollar for dollar. Like you and I can exchange dollars. We don't care. Non-fungible token is a unique thing. So we're at the very start of this using the baseball analogy. We're just getting out of the dugout for this thing on digital property. So Facebook believes, I think they're trying to make a run at it, that they want this digital community of digital property where you will go to your digital home, your digital work, you'd, you'll do that through Facebook. They want, or Meta, what, they want that to happen. At the same time, you have a bunch of creators in Web3 that are believe in crypto and decentralized finance, and they're trying to make sure that happens outside of the big players. Mm. Who's going to win? I don't know who's going to win. I'm on the side of the decentralized because I think there's more opportunity for businesses that way. But I think we're moving that direction. So my advice, my advice is going to be very simple, Gare, is I don't know where it's going to go. There's a bunch of business models there already. There's, there's a LLC, digital LLC called a DAO, Decentralized Autonomous Organization. It's really getting some traction. I can go all kinds of detail. I don't want to because I think we're not there yet. I would just say, get a digital wallet, get a MetaMask account, fund it with $100 worth of Ethereum, just whatever, and go buy, a, go to OpenSea, the marketplace for uh, NFTs, and go buy one. That, mm. you're, that if you lose, you're not gonna, it's not going to be the end of the world. But mm. go through the process so you can see, oh, I now own this. I can see it. It's in my digital wallet. The blockchain tells me that I own it. And then that uh, NFT comes with some kind of rights. Maybe you get licensing rights for that art. Maybe you get to go to a, your own event of other people that own that NFT. I don't know. It's all, they're all different, but until you own one and go through that process, I can't explain it to you. You have to go through it yourself. And right now there are only 10 million wallets in the world. This is so think of the number of people out there in the world, right? Billions, seven billion plus. Yeah, right. Right now, you're so small. So right now you're hearing about this. This is like before the Internet was created. The I, I don't know where it's going to go. Nobody anticipated that we'd be watching kids do dances on TikTok 20 years ago. Like nobody knew that was going to be a thing, but it is. Right. So where is this going? And I think so start by experimenting yourself. That's what I, and that's what I felt, Joe, when I read Killing Marketing the first time that you and Robert Rose were predicting a world that was going to exist, even though some of the platforms didn't. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's where, right. We, we don't, I mean, you, if we, if it goes correctly, a business that's listening to this right now, you could create your own digital world with your own digital experience because of the information that you're sending out and the community that you build. But now is the time to start that so that when people do get acclimated to it and it becomes second nature to have a digital wallet, it'll all be on their phone. They probably won't even call it a digital wallet. It'll just be something else. They'll have easy access to it. And you want them to, back to your point, Gare, you want to earn that attention. Start earning that attention right now. So when the technology takes its next step, you're there to catch. Let's talk a, a little bit more about uh, your collaborator. Let's talk about him while he's not here. Robert oh, let's Rose. do that. <laughs> yeah, let's let's because uh, Robert collaborated with you on this book, but also some other projects. And I know you guys are are are, are best of friends, but it does speak to the theme of leadership. I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on what makes for a productive 
healthy collaboration. We see people in business running around all the time, Joe, you've seen it, trying to partner up and form partnerships, but you've had some success in this area that I think uh, we'd love to hear you weigh in on. You know, it's I'm so glad you brought up, you couched the question that way, because the reason why I met, I met Robert at an event in 2008 in Chicago, and we just happened to both be talking about the topic of content marketing. And and we met afterwards and became fast friends because because nobody else was talking about this thing. And in 2009, 2010, as the business was evolving, there was a huge opportunity in consulting. Robert is one of the best consultants on the planet. He's amazing and he loves it. I don't like consulting one-on-one. I like strategy and business building. And we got together and I said, you like to do that. You're great at that, Robert. I'm pretty good at this strategy thing. If you focus on that and I'll stay out of your hair and I'll focus on this and we'll update each other that the business of content marketing Institute took off for it. And it's worked very well for us as well in the podcast. He plans out all the content for the podcast. I produce the podcast. We stay out of each other's way. We respect, we respect the things that we do really well. And we, we let each other do it. And that's sort of our, that's how we work with employees as well. Let, let them, who, what are their expertise areas? What are your expectations? Tell them and then get out of their way. And if they have any bumps, how do you help uh, flatten that road so it's not bumpy for them anymore? That's the job of a leader to make sure you do that. So Robert and I have been great at that. So from collaborations, which sometimes don't work out, we know our roles. We communicate those roles on a regular basis. We're comfortable with those and we go do our thing. And I think that's why we're successful. I think from the outside looking in, if I may, uh, Joe, it also seems like you share similar values in that you're both playing the long game. You're not part of this hustle culture that has become, (laughs) you know, I'm not a big fan of the hustle hustle culture. And we're we're not going to get into that today. But what we are going to get into is another question uh, from our uh, from our, uh, you know, our our collaborator, Stephen Christofferson. Uh, back in Calgary, we're going to get Stephen back on, and uh, you know because we we could we could uh, debate all day the merits or non merits of hustle, but what's more yeah. important, Stephen, you've got another question from our uh, live viewing audience. Yes, a lot of questions surrounding the upcoming holiday season. I think now more than ever, small business leaders are really depending on this holiday season uh, to be really beneficial and profitable. So what content marketing advice would you give to a small business owner to make the most of the 2021 holiday season? Well, I mean, there's a lot of things that you can do product-wise, but if you're talking about specifically about content, I would anticipate their needs and the questions that your audience has around the holiday season, specific to your business. So specific to your business, what happened? Do they have downtime? Do they not? Do they have training budget? Do they not? Um, are there supply chain issues that happen around the holiday? Well, probably all over the place, but right now specifically for your industry. So ask yourself, what are the questions that your audience asks specifically around the holidays or maybe this holiday? And like my friend, uh, Marcus Sheridan, who runs River Pools and Spas, he, he became the number one salesperson for uh, fiberglass pools because he would write down all the questions his customers would have and he would answer those questions online every day. That's all he did. So if you take that approach similar to what's going on at this specific time of the year, you can not only help yourself this way, because let's say it goes out, hey, holiday tips specific to your business in your email newsletter or in your podcast or a YouTube series, what will happen is, and we talked about this before, Gare, you can benefit from that next year and next holiday season and the season after that, because that is going to get found on Google or it's going to get found on a podcast or whatever the case is. So I would write down those questions specific to holiday and then figure out how you can put that into your editorial or content calendar and then get your team involved in making sure that happens. And that could be a great long-term asset. You know, there's so much to look forward to in the in the opportunities. And we've literally, Joe, we could do three hours straight and okay. not miss a beat because this topic is so fascinating and also unlimited in terms of where uh, it, it, it can take anyone. Um, but we do have to, you know, as they say, bring the proceedings to an end. I think Ian Gillen once said that on stage at a Deep Purple uh, concert. <laughs> but we're going to play a little game if you're okay. up for it. It's yeah. called next question. All right, let's do it. It's where we go rapid fire. Next question. One-on-one right. on one dinner date with anyone, Joe, dead or alive, who would you dine with? Billy Joel. What books are you reading right now? 
uh, I am reading the, um, I forgot the name of the title, the, the one about the GameStop, uh, the GameStop AMC issue. I can't remember the name of the, the author. I'm totally going to forget that, but uh, let's put, let's put this one. The one that I read every year, uh, stranger in a strange land by Robert Heinlein. Number one, I learned something from that from a business. It's a science fiction book, but I learned business purposes for that ever. And then also Think and Grow Rich, Napoleon Hill. I always read that one. On a scale of one to 10, how weird are you? Jeez. Uh, I would probably say seven. My wife would answer 12. You can pick any actor in the world, Joe. Who's going to play you? in your film biopic when it gets released? <laughs> uh, I would like to say Brad Pitt, but that's so unrealistic. It, it's probably more like Danny DeVito. Okay. You're, al <laughs> you're alone in your car. Joe, you're driving through Cleveland alone in your car. Maybe you're out in the suburbs. What do you think about most when you're alone in your car? Uh, Number one, I think about how my kids are doing at university. Uh, number two, I'm probably thinking about what's going on with Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. Okay, now it's time for the traditional Lipton Pivo survey in honor of Inside the Actor Studio host, the great James Lipton and French journalist Bernard Pivo. Joe, what is your favorite word? Grit. What is your least? favorite word can't what turns you on <laughs> i'm sorry my mind went a, a, a couple different places on that one um showing up what turns you off not showing up what sound or noise do you love uh well i uh, any song from billy joel pretty much Bring us a song. You're the piano man. That's right. Absolutely. Older what, stuff is better. What sound or noise do you hate? Uh, I would say when somebody drops a plate or a cup, it scares the crap out of me. What is your favorite curse word? Uh, <laughs> do you want me to say it? <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm probably a fan when used well uh, of the f word when used purposely what profession other than your own would you like to attempt well i i grew up in the funeral industry i love that industry i if i wasn't what i'm doing now i probably would be a funeral director what profession under no circumstances would you ever do uh police officer i think that's such a difficult job if heaven exists, what do you hope our heavenly father says when you arrive at the pearly gates? Uh, join your family. Do you have a personal creed or motto, Joe? Something in the area of four to seven, eight words that you absolutely live by. I, I actually said it before. It is my personal creed. It's a little bit longer than that, but it is, if you've tried something and failed, you are vastly better off than if you had tried nothing and succeeded. I've had that since I was eight years old and I, I think about it every day. Let's talk about how our listeners and viewers can connect with you online and get plugged into all the great work you're doing, Joe. Sure. Th thank you. Yeah. On social media, I'm at Joe Polizzi, P-U-L-I-Z-Z-I, -Z -Z -I, Twitter, LinkedIn, um, Facebook, and then I'm at The Tilt. So thetilt.com, if you want to go and subscribe, I write there um, almost every week and you can uh, get in touch with me anywhere there. So I'd love you to, if you love this content marketing stuff, it would be thetilt.com. And then my podcast with our good friend, Robert Rose, This Old Marketing. If you want an hour of this every week and this discussion a little bit more, that's what we do every week. We cannot say goodbye without fulfilling our promise. Your all-time favorite five, Cleveland Browns. Uh, let's see, number five, it would be Clay Matthews. Number four, Bernie Kozar. Number three, Kevin Mack. Number two, to Webster Slaughter and number one, nobody would ever pick this, 
but because he had a great year and I remember it really well. And he was on the cover of Madden the year after is Tommy Vardell. <laughs> that would be, <laughs> nobody would ever pick that, but I had a Vardell Jersey. So there you go. Touchdown, Tommy Vardell. There you go. His yep. spirit still lives in Cleveland it, and beyond. It Joe, absolutely does. we introduced you today as the godfather of content marketing. Do you have a favorite quote, a favorite scene from that classic movie, the first movie that launched the trilogy that oh. might tie all the loose ends? Because I know, Joe, that you could probably make an offer that some of our listeners and viewers could not refuse. But if there's a godfather moment for you, what is it? You know, it was, it's, this is, it might be from two, but it was, it was from the, wedding that they had when they were out in Vegas and Michael Corleone basically choreographed the entire wedding to his purposes. And I think I don't, I don't want to be Michael Corleone, but what I, what I loved about that is everything that he did throughout the whole movie, but specifically in that scene, he uh, had a strategy for everything that was going on. And I think, you know, if I'm taking a learning from that, Gare, is the fact that I want to be more strategic about what I do every day. And I think if we can learn anything is in our marketing and in our lives, if we can be more strategic and have more purpose, uh, we will we will do better and we will be successful. So, and he was pretty darn successful in a horrible way, but it worked out to his advantage. He certainly created a legacy. Joe Polizzi, thanks so much for joining us and wishing you uh, continued success. Same to you. It's been a pleasure. And yeah, we do really appreciate Joe uh, for joining us uh, today. And, uh, you know, we uh, so appreciate uh, you for tuning in. And if you want to know more about Tech Canada and the world-class programs being offered, check out the website www.techtec-canada.com. What was it that Joe spoke of? that made you stop and think. For me, it's several. Number one, the need for the tilt, to have your differentiated message even before you pick your platform. But what was yours? Feel free to connect with me uh, personally. The private email is gare at garemaxwell.com, G-A-I-R at garemaxwell.com. If you enjoyed the leadership standard, feel free to share with others in your online and social networks. So hit that like, subscribe, and share button because you just never know through a simple share who you might inspire to also go to, uh, to go full throttle and kick it up in the new frontier. On behalf of everyone, Stephen Christofferson, Alexander, Kat, Mark Johnson, the crew at the Tech Canada office in Calgary, thank you for being part of the Leadership Standard.